Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. We're talking about unconditional love and seeing the divine. And it's not, it's not love of the actions. It's not saying, oh, you're divine, therefore the fact that you just snatched my phone is okay. I'll love you anyway. Oh, you're divine. The fact that you just did this horrible thing to me or to our planet is okay. I'll love you anyway. It's not that. The action was wrong. Which is why I said, good for you for running after. If you want to file a police report, I would support you in filing a police report because we are spirit. We are divinity. But there's also this plane of existence of matter. It's not that matter doesn't exist. It absolutely exists. Take a knife and cut my skin, I will bleed. That's not an optical illusion. Take this water and dump it on the camera, the camera will be ruined. Not an optical illusion. Impact of matter on matter. Pour it on me, I will get wet. Not an optical illusion. So when we talk about recognizing spirit, it's not a negation of matter. It's not saying, ah, free for all, anarchy, because we're all, we're all just divine spirit, so anything goes. It's about our attention to the level of existence of ourselves and the universe as we move through it. But that doesn't mean I don't notice the table and allow myself to trip over it and crack my head open. It's both. But what we find is for the spiritual path, for our our awakening, because ultimately, as we, as we always talk about in here, the reason that we're here on planet Earth, the reason we've been given a human body, a human brain, a human mind with the ability to witness, the ability to be conscious of my conscious consciousness. We don't think that other species have that, which is why it said that humans are the ones who attain enlightenment. Because in order to do that, you have to be conscious of your consciousness. I have to be able to look at myself and say, ah, anger is approaching. Mm -hmm. If I simply react in anger, this is what we talk about as the animalistic way of living. I'm angry, so I bite, or I hit, literally or metaphorically. I'm hungry, so I eat. Whatever it may be, it's there. I'm feeling sexually aroused, so I mate with it. Whatever or whoever it may be. I am, that, those are our, our animalistic instin- instincts. What What separates humans is the ability to be conscious of that. We're not the only species by any means that knows right from wrong. Pooja Swamiji always talks about, you know, the dogs who are hanging around the food carts. And the minute that 
the food cart guy looks away, they snatch the bread, and then they look around. And if no one is there, they'll eat it right there. But if someone is there, they'll run into a corner. So they absolutely know they've just snatched something that didn't belong to them, that wasn't right, because they're, they're sort of waiting to be caught and scolded. So we're not the only species that knows right from wrong, but what we are is the only species, we think, that has the ability to be conscious of what's going on in my own consciousness. To say, ah, anger. Ah, jealousy. Ah, lust. And to be able to then take it to say, I am not. I am not this electrical and chemical pattern that's going on in my physical gray and white matter. I am not this experience of neurologic arousal that we call anger. It's happening. Hook me up to a brain scan. They're going to be able to say, ah, yeah, arousal, anger, fear. We can do that. Not that. There's an I that existed before I was angry. There's an I that will exist after I'm angry. There is an I that existed before I was this current 47-year-old female sitting right here. There will be an I who will exist after that. Both in this literal plane, I'll then be a 48-year-old female, right? I mean, the physical body changes. So I'm not that. There is an I that's eternal, we say. Never born, never dies. But even if you're not there yet, just that has existed with this body, but that isn't the body, because the body keeps changing. But the I is still there. The mind keeps changing, the emotions keep changing, the thoughts keep changing, but I is there. So when we talk about the spiritual focus, It's not a negation of the material world. What it is is an awareness of, yeah, I'm angry. There's a pattern that's going on. But that's what we're going to call the little I. Not the real I. The real I isn't angry. The real I is able to watch my little I. Watch, ah, anger. Fear self-righteousness, injustice, insecurity. Meaning now, who's going to snatch my phone tomorrow if I talk on it? It could happen again. Games of the mind. But there's an eye that's able to watch that. That's able to sit there and to see. See those emotions. See the fear. See the indignance. Indignation, I guess, is the word. See the anger. See all of that. If I can identify with that, then I'm not a slave to my emotions, to my thoughts. That's the goal. The goal of our spiritual practice is freedom. That's the highest goal. When we talk about moksha, literally moksha is translated as freedom. So I'm looking for freedom. If I am locked into, hooked into my emotional state, I am not free. The guy snatches my phone, I'm angry. No, it doesn't mean your anger is misplaced or wrong. It just means that you're not free in that moment. Ultimately, you should, you should be able to have the choice to be able to be anger. So when you go to the police station and you tell them this guy, you want to be angry because if you go in all peaceful and yeah, well, you know, the guy did it, and the police aren't going to take you seriously. You need to be able to bring anger. My God, I can't believe it. I came here visiting the city and this guy, you, you, you better do something. 
Otherwise, I'm going to go to my embassy. I mean, whatever you need to do. So the anger or the feelings aren't the problem. The problem is when I'm not free, when I'm a slave to them. There are absolutely places, parenting, teaching, administrating, where we need to be able to bring an experience of anger Because sadly, that's how you get taken seriously in a lot of situations. But I'm not a slave of that anger. I'm actually free. And simply able to recognize in this moment, I better go in there and act angry so these guys take me seriously. But your freedom is your highest goal, not getting your phone back. Not never having your phone stolen again. Yesterday it was the phone, tomorrow it'll be your purse, the day after it'll be a gold, gold chain on your neck. I mean, so, so the, the question becomes, how can I not bounce up and down with that which happens around me? Right? And sometimes the stealing's going to be literal. The guy literally comes up and grabs it from you. Sometimes it won't be so direct. Sometimes it'll be just a stock market that falls. Sometimes it'll be an act of nature. Tree fell on your car. You don't have insurance. End of car. (laughs) Right? So sometimes it's literally something steals it out of your hand. Sometimes it's the universe. But if every time something literal is stolen from me, sometimes our our respect is stolen. Somebody criticizes you in front of people. Your reputation is hurt. In India, this is a very big thing. My ejet, my... Okay, scold me all you want in private, but for God's sakes, don't do it in front of other people. Like, maintain my, you know, my dignity. This person has stolen my dignity. So if I, if I lose my freedom every time someone steals something from me, I'm not getting very far on my path, my spiritual path. And it's not about being judged. I mean, there's nobody judging your path. It's about your freedom from suffering. Because anger creates suffering. Jealousy creates suffering. Competition creates suffering. Holding grudges creates suffering. Living in fear creates suffering. Living in indignation creates suffering. So I'm looking for freedom because that's my only way out of this suffering, which is not the same as apathy. It is not the same as indifference. We are not saying, oh yeah, no problem, steal my phone, I've become very spiritual. (laughs) We're simply saying the universe is going to happen. In a whole variety of unexpected ways. And our goal is to be free in the midst of that happening. And the only way to do that is to be identified with that which isn't what's happening. So that's what it's about. So see the part of you that wasn't the owner of the phone. Can you see the part of you that was the stealer of the phone? That's that's the stuff that really gets us gets us growing. Because ultimately, if the same spirit runs through us, 
then I should, I should be able to identify on that level with all of it. And I'm not saying it's easy at all. But simply, simply the intention to go there is a very, very powerful spiritual practice. So I begin by identifying as the one whose phone was stolen. I then bring myself to identify as the part that never owned a phone, part that doesn't own anything, part that came in with nothing, will go with nothing. And then slowly, and you just keep taking it as far as you can go. Okay, you can do that. Can you then identify as that longing, as that grabbing? Maybe you've never grabbed a phone. If you grab something else. Can you, can, we, we can always identify, if not with the actual act, with, with that intention. So we've all experienced anger. We've all experienced jealousy. We've all experienced greed and lust. Well, these are the things that lead people to act in wrong ways. So even though I may not have ever actually snatched a phone out of someone's hand, can I identify with that that might lead someone to do it? And again, simply the intention of trying to go there. A, minimizes my anger. And B, opens my heart in a way that's far more valuable than the phone ever was. So we we take care of the material world. We understand it. As I said, we notice the table so we don't trip over it. We're careful not to spill the water on the camera so it doesn't get ruined. We take care of our things. It's energy. But we understand we're not them. So we just keep bringing it back to the truth of who we are which is not an owner of a phone. It's not one who can own anything. Not one with any rights other than freedom. God never, never said in any of the scriptures I know, never said, I promise you, you'll never lose anything. I promise you'll never be hurt. I promise you'll never get an illness or a disease. I promise that your loved ones will never be hurt. I promise they won't die. There's no, there's no promises from God like that. The promise we get is, come to me and you will experience freedom. Come to me and you will experience what you are here for. Not come to me, do good things, and I'll protect you. That's that it comes from our concept of sort of God as just this mother, father sort of caretaker. But God's ultimate goal for us is not you should never be stolen from, you should never be hurt, you should never be cheated, you should never be betrayed. God's ultimate goal for us is you should wake up. And if I've got to send somebody to snatch a phone out of your hands and have you chase him down the street in order to bring you into a moment of, oh, wow, okay, wait, what's going on here? I'll do it. If I need to set fire to your house, I'll do it. If I need to give you an illness, I'll do it. Not as a punishment. Not as a punishment but as simply a tool to wake you up. Because that's the only goal of God's. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. 
Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. The lotus is a perfect example. And this is why we love the lotus flower, use it in so many divine symbols and artwork and temples and so much. Because the lotus sits in the muck, in the dirt, but is untouched by it. So the detachment is not a detachment of, I'm out of here. It's a detachment of, I'm in here. I'm in the world. But I'm not quite of the world. And the lotus is the symbol of that. So be in the world. Be fully in the world. The lotus flower could not blossom beautifully if the roots were not deep, deep, deep in the muck. So be in the world. Being on a spiritual path does not mean I go through the rest of my life sort of half-heartedly. Do it sincerely. Do it sincerely. Whatever you're doing, in the family, in the workplace, in the world. But realize, I'm not of this. And picture literally sort of that which you're detaching from. Imagine that you were a petal of a lotus flower that a a speck of dirt landed on. It's going to just slide right off it, right? Slide right off into the water. Imagine that you're that that petal of that flower, that it can just slide right off, slide right off. But remember that wherever you are, I mean, we're all in the world. Even here in Rishikesh, we're in the world. You know, when we talk about being in the world versus not being in the world, it's, it's almost, almost a false distinction. Because the truth really is that the dilemmas of the world are not caused by the world themselves, but they're caused by your mind. And that stays with you wherever you go. You could go sit off in a cave, but your mind would be there. And so the stuff that works in your mind is going to work in your mind wherever you are. So the goal is, when we talk about being in the world but being spiritual, is I'm not letting my mind be impacted by this. I'm doing what I need to do, but I'm not getting wrapped up in it. I'm not thinking it is me. 
Do your job sincerely. This is core order of Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, right? No, you may not run away, Arjun. And no, you may not fight this war in a, an indifferent, apathetic kind of way. Fully. Fully engaged. Fully sincere. And realizing who you really are. Realizing the truth of the self. So that which we detach from, it's not, detachment is not actually a detachment from the world itself. It's a detachment from our expectations of the world, our way of interacting with our minds in the world. That's what we need to detach from. That which makes me feel very jealous or very competitive or very frustrated. That's what I need to detach from. I need to detach from how does my salary compare to other people's salary or how does, how does my beauty compare to other people's beauty or how does the type of car I drive compare to the type of car other people drive. I need to detach from that. It's not that I need to detach from the world itself. It's all in the mind. So in the world, how can you detach from the games? The world is is not what makes your mind play it. The world is just kind of the board of your game. The games are played in the mind. So how can you, in your mind, detach from that which makes you feel Stressed and upset, jealous, competitive, angry, lustful, all of that. How can I detach from that? And the tools for that are meditation, number one. Because when we meditate, we have an experience of who we are actually inside, the truth of who we are, and that stays with us. Also, inquiry and remembering. Pooja Swamiji says introspection. And just constantly ask yourself, really? Like suddenly you're all upset about something. Someone said something. They did something. Just ask yourself, really? That's me? That's not me. I'm I'm that which is whole and that which is complete. Okay, I'm doing my job. I'm going to do it the best I can. But I'm not going to lose myself over it. I'm not going to lose myself in it. So do it like that, and whatever you do, do it as an offering to God. Whatever you're doing, balancing spreadsheets in some financial company, fine. Waiting tables, fine. Pumping gas, fine. Whatever you're doing, Do it as an offering to God. Now, obviously, if you can do something that helps make more of an obvious difference in the world, that's actually helping God's creation, it's going to be a lot easier to feel that. If you can do some volunteering, do some seva, it's a lot easier to feel that than if you're working as a waiter. But the truth is, whatever we do should be done as an offering to God. If you're there, whatever you do becomes spiritual. Otherwise, you know, we're on our way 
to yoga class or to meditation class or to the Monday or something, and we're stuck in traffic, right? We get a flat tire, something happens. Suddenly I'm furious. I'm furious. I'm furious at the person who made me late. I'm furious at the traffic. I'm furious at the guy who called me as soon as I was leaving the house because it delayed me for five more minutes. I'm all worked up because, my God, I've got to get to my yoga class. I've got to get to meditation. I've got to get to the temple. This was my spiritual time. Well, all right, maybe today my meditation time was meant to be spent in traffic. Maybe I was supposed to have a meditation on traffic. Meditation on my connection with the drivers of all the other cars. Either we're all one or we're not all one. And if we are all one, then that all includes the guys driving the car next to me. It includes the pedestrians who know I'm not going to speed up to zoom around and could accidentally run over just so that I can make the light and get there 30 seconds faster. We're all one. Which means wherever I am, I'm able to use it as a way of furthering my spiritual practice. And lastly, really ask yourself how much you can do in the service of the world. Because that's that's the easiest. If If you can actually work for an organization that's doing something, if you can do some seva, either paid or unpaid, either way, it's going to be a lot easier to remember I'm a tool in God's hands. There's going to feel a lot more integrity in that. So try wherever you can, whatever you can do. If not full-time, part-time. If you don't even have part-time, at least at least give smiles. Can you bring smiles to the world? Can you bring an extra sandwich at lunch and give it to the guy on the street? I mean, there's always something we can do. Can you give someone else the taxi you just hailed? You hailed it, came for you, but there's this nice person sent. Let let them take it. Can you take the next one? Just little, little tiny things. But that enable us to make our, our lives in the world an opportunity for spiritual practice. Not that I get to go home and give myself the spiritual stamp of approval just because I gave somebody a sandwich or my taxi, because that's also a trap. Ah, done my spiritual work today. God, I'm so spiritual. You know, I always bring two sandwiches. I give one to the poor guy. It's also a trap. I do it not for them. I do it to remind me. I do it because for whatever reason at this time in my life I'm stuck in that world and all I can do literally feasibly given whatever my circumstances are the only thing that I actually can do in service to creation is bring a sandwich for the poor guy. I'm doing it for me. The fact that he takes it is a gift to me. So we do these things not not to give ourselves a stamp of approval, not to inflate our ego, but as a way of reminding ourselves, because otherwise we forget. Otherwise we become in the world, of the world. We become the world. So I do the, we do these things to remind us. Oh, wait, I'm supposed to be smiling at people because I'm, I'm an emanator of love and peace and joy. Okay, great. 
forgot for a few hours. Okay, we'll try again. Then your focus shifts from got to get to that meeting, oh my God, I'm 30 seconds late, to, oh wait, I forgot to smile. I passed that guy without giving him a smile. Okay, not going to pass anybody else without giving them a smile. Just shifts your focus. And it makes whatever you're doing an opportunity for spirituality. Thich Nhat, Thich Nhat Hanh says, all right, even you're working on Wall Street, you're going to meetings. You can walk from one meeting to another meeting mindfully. You can at least practice walking meditation from one meeting to another meeting. So wherever you can get it, whatever you can get, as much as we can do, keep doing it. And then do more tomorrow. And then do more the next day. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. How can a person attain spirituality without taking sannyas. Okay, so first of all, some terms. Sannyas. Sannyas is the official ordination, you can say, into a monastic path. And so it's typically orange, uh, in almost all of the lineages and some of them it's white, but it's a very, very specific and official order into which one is initiated. It comes with its own set of very specific rules. So it's a path of celibacy it's a path of simplicity. It's a path of renunciation. It's like being a, a monk or a nun in any of the other world's religions. Spirituality. Because remember the question said, how to attain spirituality without taking sannyas. So spirituality, very literally, if you look it up in the dictionary, which I actually did several years ago, literally means pertaining to spirit. That's what spirituality is, pertaining to spirit. And what I love about that, the definition is, most of us live our lives from the perspective of matter. We feel like an object. We think we are an object. We therefore see the world as an object. This physical being, 
we think it is the self. We therefore think other people's physical beings are also them and they become, they become objects to us. So the material way of looking at the world says, I'm an object. I am this physical body and I am therefore all of the things that have happened to it. I am all of the identities and the titles that I've given to it, that the world has given to it based on my color or my gender or my nationality or my religion or my beauty or lack thereof or my intelligence or lack thereof or whatever it may be. I am all of these titles and identity. The spiritual way of looking at the world says, no, you have a body, but you are the spirit. And if you doubt that, think back over times in your life. Think back as far as you can remember, early childhood. Then think back to a moment may, maybe in elementary school or junior high school. Then think to a moment maybe in university. Then depending on how old you are, think back to a moment, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And what you find is that although the body has changed remarkably, you don't even have to hear my, you know, scientific thing about how frequently the cells of the body regenerate and whatnot. You just look at pictures. What did you look like at five? What did you look like at 15? What do you look like at 25? Well, the body has changed completely. And yet, we were saying and experiencing I along the way. There was never a moment in which we didn't feel I because the body had changed. So the body keeps changing, but the I stays constant. And so the I must be something other than the body. So that's, that's the spirit. We have a body. We use our body. Some of our bodies are better at certain things than others. Some of our bodies are certain colors. Some of them are different shapes. We've all got different year models of bodies, right? I was saying earlier today, I have a 1971 model body, but... But I'm not the body. I'm the spirit in the body. I'm the spirit using the body. And when this body is done, I'll get a new one. It's the beauty of a, a path of reincarnation. So the way of looking at the world that's spiritual says not... I'm a body, you're a body, you're an object, I'm an object, we are separate. Let's fight over scarce resources. Let's push each other out of the way to get to the top. Let's draw lines based on our colors or our religions or our sexual orientations or our countries. But it says, I'm spirit. And you're spirit. And I have a body and you have a body and yours may be a different model than the 1971 version, but it's irrelevant, utterly irrelevant. Like what model cars we drive, irrelevant. We're spirit. And so that's, that's really all that spirituality is, is a commitment to look at the world as spirit, which of course means we are one. Because there's one spirit that flows through all of us. Different vehicles, different vessels, different containers, different reflections of the divine. But it's one spirit. And so spirituality is just a commitment to look at the world like that. And to live like that. And you certainly don't need to take vows of monasticism in order to do that. In fact, our scriptures are full of stories of householders, sages, rishis, who were householders, who were married, who had families, who had jobs. So there is nothing at all about a path of spirituality that you cannot attain in a family, in the world, with a day job. 
It's more difficult on some level. It's easier on some level. The way that it's more difficult, of course, is because you get pulled into what in this culture they call Maya, which is this, this illusory belief that really what matters most is what school your kid gets into. That really what matters most is who your husband or wife was talking to at the party you just came from. That really what matters most is who was wearing the nicest dress or the nicest sari or who had more jewelry than you did or who gained or lost a few pounds or who showed up in what car. That's, that's this illusory aspect of Maya is that that's what matters. And we get stuck in that world. So a path of renunciation, of course, is a, a path that makes that aspect of spirituality much more simple. You're living in a world surrounded by people who are all committed to spirituality. You're, you're not going to find people who say to you, you know, my God, you gained a few pounds. You look horrible. Or my God, didn't you wear that yesterday? Well, yeah, I wear the same thing every day. You know, you're not going to find people who, who say that. You're not going to find people who think that. You're not going to find people who judge each other based on what you look like, based on how much money you make, based on, and nobody makes any money. There's not going to be a judgment on what family you come from, what model your body is. So it's much easier in that way. But if you are someone, as all of you are, certainly the vast majority of you are, who have chosen paths of householders, You've chosen marriage, you've chosen kids, whether you've already done it or you're just thinking about doing it. Either way, that's the path you've chosen. And so the question then becomes, how do I, living the life of a householder, living a non-monastic life, how do I embrace spirituality? Which is the same way that you embrace it when you've chosen a monastic path, which is to remember that you are spirit. And that those with whom you're interacting are spirit. And so instead of looking at the world as objects who we can use, fulfill some purpose for us, or who are obstacles on our path, hurdles we have to push out of the way, we look at the world as reflections of the self, reflections of spirit. And so our, our commitment becomes whether we're looking in the eyes of other people living in an ashram, other monastics, or whether we're looking in the eyes of our husband or our wife or our children or our in-laws or our employees or our employers. Can I see you as spirit? Well, it doesn't mean denying you have a body. It doesn't mean denying that you're doing a job. It doesn't mean that what you're doing isn't important doesn't mean that as an employer, you have to just kind of let your employees do whatever they want. Wouldn't be very successful to run a business like that, as most of you know. But what it means is that as you interact with them, the highest importance in that interaction is to come at it from a place of spirit. Yeah, you wear the mask of CEO or president or boss. But can you remember in the interaction that you're spirit? And yeah, they're wearing the mask of employee. But can you remember their spirit? And can you remember that the highest goal in every interaction, more important than the project, more important than the deal, more important than anything else, is for us to interact in the world as spirit. And to remember that. And that's doable in every single circumstance. And the last point I want to mention, because I can just, I can hear the question come up is, well, how do I run a successful business like that then? I mean, if, if my highest goal is to interact with my employees as spirit rather than employees, how do I make sure that they're 
doing a good job? How do I make sure they're doing the right thing? If my highest goal as an educator is to interact with students as spirit rather than as students, how do I make sure they're learning what I'm supposed to be teaching them? And here's what's incredible. When people are seen as spirit, when people are seen, and when I say spirit, I don't mean just the ethereal, non-tangible aspect. I mean the truth of who they are, the love of who they are, the depth of who they are, the soul of who they are that's in a body that has had real experiences in that body. When I, when I connect with someone on that level and I create space for them to connect with themselves on that level, what you find is remarkable. All of that, which we really want in employees, in students, if we are companies that are looking to make a difference in the world, if we're education systems that are looking to make a difference in the world, is people who are awake and alive and courageous and connected. Not robots. Artificial intelligence is already going to give us plenty of robots who can do what humans have been doing for hundreds of years. The humans who are left in the workplace, we need them to be humans. We need them to be able to do what robots can't do, which is be creative, which is have intuition, which is be connected to the universe in a way that what that universe needs flows through them. And they have the courage and the connection to bring it forth rather than thinking, oh my God, my boss is going to yell at me. Oh my God, my colleagues are going to think I'm so stupid. I'm going to be the laughing stock. Forget it. That is not what we need today, neither in business nor in education, nor anywhere. We need people who are able to connect to spirit. And if we open the space for them to do that, whether they're my spouse, my children, my in-laws, my employees, my employer, if I, as connected to myself, am able to therefore create space for others to connect to themselves based on how I see them. We're going to bring about a world that is connected. A world that is courageous, a world that steps up to the opportunity and the invitation that the universe is offering, which is wake up, wake up to who you are, which is not a robot, not a cookie out of someone's cookie cutter. Not your grades, not your title, not how your supervisor rated your report. But wake up to who you really are. And when that happens, that's when real transformation takes place. So regardless of what path you have chosen to walk, a path of renunciation or a path of non-renunciation. Either way, we have the exact same task, which is remember who we are. And then whatever we're doing, whether we're stuffing envelopes, licking stamps, washing windows, bringing the boss, you know, lunch and a cup of coffee, doesn't matter. Because there's nothing anymore that's low or high. There's nowhere left to go. That doesn't mean that in our career world, we don't have goals of getting that job or attaining this. It's not a goalless life, but it's a life that recognizes there is nowhere that I need to go for me. And so whether I'm stuffing envelopes forever or whether I get the corner office next week, either way, I'm spirit 
and I can be awake and plugged in and connected and beneficial to the world just as much in the mail room as in the CEO's office. The world doesn't need more CEOs or presidents. As I said, it needs people who are awake and connected. And you can do that just as well in the mail room, as the window washer, as the guy who refills the coffee maker, whatever your task may be. As someone who is connected, you're going to spread that. You're going to share that. And that's your task on earth. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time on Ohm Times Radio. (laughs) 